you mentioned you mentioned the planetary um i wanted to ask how is this different from when we talk about climate anxiety or things like that uh because uh a lot of the anxiety i feel is so oh when we talk about climate anxiety we talk about issues we see regarding climate change in certain ways and how that's affecting people's mental and physical health as well we call it climate anxiety but you also include physical health as well because um different temperatures cause rise to different diseases which were probably not existent in that area before um so on and so forth so how is this idea of uh, your idea of planetary melancholy different or growing building upon that idea yeah i mean the thing is i mean climate anxiety was one of the first ideas i was looking into and my 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 concern with framings like that is that in general right like in the pub, in in the public consciousness there's this there's this sense that the, the climate breakdown is going to be like the movie 2012 you know like suddenly everything's going to explode you know the sun's going to burn us down but really that's not what it is it's it's a it's a it's a it's different processes happening at different speeds and it's going to lead to like you know increasing heat leads to food shortages in one part of the world which which leads to you know civil unrest there there are glaciers melting pathogens in the air potential for new kinds of health risks right which over time could like destabilize economic pathways which could lead to you know uh, uh these sort of trans transnational uh, resource conflicts which would lead to you know people actually dying we're seeing that happening right now right? there's 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 a, the energy crisis is leading to a, a moral crisis right and a, and a, and a really a genocide and so the thing with the climate the framing climate anxiety is it makes you think that you're feeling bad because it's getting hot but the, the, it's i guess it's worth talking about the climate crisis itself as being not just about the climate but it's it's actually a deeper sociological sort of condition that it's 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 slowly going to multiply and it is into all of these different layers that aren't necessarily related to the climate but everything else right? it's it's going to, it's, it's going to affect all of these different processes so if you're feeling a certain alienation already it gets hotter outside we spend more time indoors right and now we spend even more time digitally and that leads to another sort of fire i mean you can sort of keep going on and on into these different uh, down these different sort of systemic uh, logics and also we know that all of this affects uh, certain social groups discriminated populations far more than others right and that's the thing with climate anxiety it seems to conflate the experience of watching these crises from a distance from actually being the first to experience it right if you are in the tropical world where you're experiencing massive heat spikes or if you're in a coastal community that's actually experiencing flooding the framing of climate anxiety doesn't doesn't differentiate that experience of like fear because you're actually going to lose your home to you know sitting at home and watching it on the internet right and i feel like adding that nuance was something we thought was critical which kind of brought us to the section of plant type on call no very nice uh i i i also while you were saying that i also remembered something which one of my previous guests had said so marian radan works at the einstein institute in new york and she was talking about how people perceive pain differently after uh have based on like which climate they've grown up in um not not just that so they've taken twins this is study in america they've taken twins who've had very very different lifestyles and apparently their subconscious pain perception is very different so uh and so your social economic status where you live your climate so and so all affect these things which is very interesting i um and yeah i wanted to just point that out it's pretty cool that the way you guys are talking about it is kind of bringing back all almost all the other episodes which people have spoken about to me and they're kind of like combining it at the same time because what you guys are talking about is so broad that's cool i mean that's why we we did this right like to attract to attract everyone like come to us <laughs> <laughs> it's like throw your net out real wide and see what you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also to that point, I think it's it's worth noting that I mean there's a way in which the climate crisis 
is going is disproportionately going to affect um, certain populations more than others, right? Like it's it's not Europe is going to experience the fallout of the climate crisis, right? People in the tropics in the next ten years, if you don't bring the temperature down, are literally going to die of heat, right? And, and increasing sort of water shortages and the glaciers melting, right? Which is not to say that there may not be specific climate climatological things happening in Europe. It's just that there's a disproportionality to this. And if you think about um, cases historically of like mines being built around, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, populations of color predominantly in, in the West, um, you'll see that the climate press is only going to make this worse. So if you're trying to do, I mean, people talk about the uh, transitioning to electricity, like it's, it's going to save us all from everything. But even transitioning to electricity requires us to mine critical minerals uh, like lithium or nickel or cobalt. And all of that is seeing these historic labor relations, these violent labor relations get exp like uh, exaggerated even more, right? So now you have these horrible, basically almost enslaved labor processes in Congo where people are digging for uh, cobalt with their bare hands because there's such a high demand for it. And there's there, nobody's really kept thinking about safety measures or anything like that because historically the West has never offered the same uh, uh, standards of safety to the quote unquote third world, right? So I, I think I think about this all the time, right? When I was when I was in the U.S., you'd get these weather warnings about a cyclone approaching or something, or like it's going to be a, a heavy, you know, like a, a thunderstorm today, and I'm just like. This is an evening of rain in India. Like you guys have a very high, like you, <laughs> like you guys don't understand what a thunderstorm really is, right? And like I, I think about this all the time because it does translate to many different things. And we know this even in things like the ways in which uh, the pain uh, of women is typically, I mean, is, is disproportionately measured, right? You, 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 you assume that women can. Uh, uh, handle more pain, and that black women especially can handle even more pain. And then we get these like reflected in the in the in in how our healthcare is provided, I mean, which is the point actually that Val brought up. And I don't know if you want to say something more about that. Yeah, well, yeah, this is. I was gonna kind of draw out even more too, and like talk to that point, but just the fact that this climate crisis is really just bringing to surface things that have been brewing for so long and that is simply because now the first world or whatever you want to call it is now being somewhat impacted by it so as soon as like there are some effects that can be perceived now it's it, now it's a crisis as if people dying in these like terrible labor conditions that particular we're talking about were not already terrible to begin with and we're not something that is still going on that people are able to ignore um, and be complacent about because frankly that's the way that things are designed here that you you don't really see what's behind the mirror and yet you're just like taking part in it and now that things are starting to emerge because even if we aren't going to be the ones that are like at the site of I mean, not we, but just like a broader we of like people in the first world are not going to be at the site of, of, say, the tragedies that will happen later on with climate crises. Like there are going to be refugees and there are going to be other um, supply demand, like things that aren't perceived now will be brought to light and we will have to deal with it then. People have been saying that for many, many years. And it, it is interesting to see that it's almost like it's just a self-fulfilled prophecy at this point. It is something that has been going on for so many years that, the, that of course, it's going to happen. But yeah, going back to what Pratik was saying, like a lot of this, I think, is simply what we decide to privilege in uh, high-level education, high-level institutional knowledges. Um, what we dis what we decide is worth studying. Um, how we design what we uh know and think specifically in academia um and i think like yeah no discipline is safe from this i think all disciplines have major blind spots that overlap and then you start to see a pattern when you zoom out a bit which is i think something else that we're trying to do 